Good morning. Those are cool, aren't they? I hope they give you in the, the right uh, attitude this morning as we continue in our series called Awe. Um, just a reminder again, if you have pictures, and, and uh, really, really love too is when people caption their pictures. It, as you're, you're out there and you take that snapshot, just not just for Instagram purposes, but, but let us know what characteristic or attribute maybe that reminds you about God at sunset or that, whatever that is. Um, just to encourage all of us, encourage all of us to step outside of ourselves into God's great, wonderful creation remind us about who we are as well. Well, this morning we are moving into a new series and we're going to be in uh, Job chapter 38 eventually here. So if you have your Bibles or you have your phone apps, you can open that because I'm not going to read the whole chapter and it goes on and on, by the way, after this. So, so I really always encourage you, be students of your own Bible, that you're responsible to take these messages and, and listen to God's voice and how he may be prompting you or pushing you towards something different. Uh, there was a survey, actually an a article that came out last May from the Washington Post, which reported that children today spend less time in unstructured outdoor play than any prior generation. And my generation are all, yeah, that's right. When I was a kid, my parents sent us outdoors and they came back at dinner time, right? That's my best get off my backyard voice I can get. But research indicates uh, there's some troubling things as a result of this, that they're finding in kids worse school performance because they're not engaging in the outdoors, less creativity, higher levels of obesity, fewer friends, and increased rates of depression and hyperactivity. And that getting outside actually leads to stronger bones from exposure from the sunlight. You know, when you're putting your sunscreen in on, remember that it's helping your kids too. And that's, that leads to better sleep because increased exposure to natural light resets our natural sleep rhythms. Now, this is true for kids, but it's true for you adults too, all right? So it's not good enough for me to say, yeah, kids, get outside and play, right? Without me doing the same thing. Some other studies have also been done that demonstrate that how time in nature actually reshapes and rewires our brains to be more in tune with our outdoor environment. And our increasing lack of exposure to creation, I think, robs us not just of some physical benefits, as it does, but I think it has a detriment on some spiritual things as well. For instance, without a, a, a more immersed experience in God's creation, I think we lack the language, the tools of language to understand scripture. I think it actually can create to an inability to really connect and it can lead to probably some unbelief in people as they're not exposed to the mysteries and the wonders of what God has created. For instance, you think about, think about the language of the Bible. From the very beginning to the very end of Revelation, the writers, inspired by God, what do they utilize? What analogies, what illustrations do they often over and over utilize to help point us towards who God is? The language of creation. Rivers and rocks and streams and oceans and waves and forests and trees. Scripture is replete with these illustrious images of what God has created to help us what? Understand who God is. And I think we lose something. There's something we lose the more, the less we're exposed to God's wonderful, mysterious, amazing creation. And the more that we are kind of, our eyes are down and focused on our work and our relationships and our, our phones. In fact, I think in terms of God creation, I feel sometimes like I'm a distracted driver. Have you seen those YouTube videos where people are on their phones and they're walking along and they run into lampposts? I think that's a warning, a little bit of an image of a warning about the lack of being and encountering God in what he's created. That we're almost so focused on what is going on right in front of us, we lose sight of what God is speaking to us all around us. That was the message that Steve, Pastor Steve, gave last week, isn't it? Based in Psalm 19, it says this, The heavens declare 
Listen to these action words. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. God is speaking, the psalmist says. God is revealing. God is pouring forth his speech. God is proclaiming the work of his hands. And if we are stuck in our stuff, what are we missing? What are we lacking as a result? <clears throat> well, that's where we're going to encounter Job this morning. And some of you say it's a weird text to, to talk about with Job. But Job really is a moment in Scripture where God utilizes creation to silence Job's questions. That creation itself, God is saying, is pointing to one specific attribute about God, and that is his wisdom. Job chapter 38, it starts with, well, don't go there yet, but let me give you a little background on Job. Job and his friends, God, there's about 30 chapters, essentially, and I'm boiling it down to its, its most general points, but 30 chapters is about essentially Job blaming God for the position, the suffering that he's enduring. And then the other significant part of these chapters is Job's friends blaming Job because they must, Job must have done something bad. Job ha, there must be some uh, unresolved sin in Job's life that has put him in this place of suffering. So these are the two explanations that the book of Job is struggling with. Did God do it or did Job do it? essentially, in regards to his suffering. And this is, this is bad. Job has lost three essential things that you would say one out of the three would be very difficult, but not three out of three. Job has lost his children. Job has lost his health. And Job has lost his wealth. Wealth is your status, your privilege, your position, and your, your places of influence. Your children, foundational of those those little beings that you love and care for, and then finally his health. And so you can wonder if you're in the position of Job. You'd ask these significant questions, but their answers were insufficient. Their answers were incomplete. And now let's turn to reading where God now has some questions for Job. Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such arrogant words? Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you. Now, God's got, I mean, this is some harsh language. Remember, Job is poetry, and, and the, the writer is helping us understand that God has these significant questions. He's, he's listened to this for 30 chapters, and now he's got some questions to raise some questions for Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Sounds a little sarcastic, doesn't it? But isn't that what you need sometimes? You need a friend to speak into your life and say, what's your problem, right? You think you know so much? You know nothing. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Have you made daylight spread to the ends of the earth to bring an end to the night's wickedness? Do you realize the extent of the earth? Tell, tell me about it if you know. It should make you chuckle. I appreciate hearing your chuckles. It's good to chuckle. Where does light come from and where does darkness go? Can you take each to its home? Do you know how to get there? But of course you know all this. For you were born before it was all created. And you are so very experienced. Yeah, <laughs> ouch, isn't it? Who makes the rain fall on barren land in a desert where no one lives? Who sends rain to satisfy the parched ground to make the tender grass spring up? Does the rain have a father who gives birth to the dew? Can you direct the movement of the stars, binding the cluster of the Pleiades or loosening the cords of Orion? Do you know the laws of the universe? Yeah, I know some laws, you know. 
thermodynamics, but can you use, but can you use them to regulate the earth? <laughs> Who gives intuition to the heart and instinct to the mind? And who is wise enough to count all the clouds? Now, Job isn't meant to be an astronomy or a science textbook here. It's really profound poetry intended to correct Job and his friends' bad theology, their understanding of God. Notice in these, in God's reply, you notice, you should notice something very important. And that is God does not directly respond to their two questions. God does not respond to the question of, did God do it? That was Job's question. And he doesn't respond to his friend's questions. It must be something wrong with Job that he's suffering. What does God do instead? God asks Job these penetrating questions in light of what? Of what God has created. So God ushers Job into this, this room to help him understand how finite and how limited his understanding is. How complex and universal is God's scope and knowledge of the planets and the moons and the stars and the animals. It's intended literally to make Job feel insignificant in light of God's great, amazing, complex, created order of the world. That's what Job is, God is doing. He's not answering their qu answers with a question, or answering their questions by saying, well, let me tell you, let me explain to you uh, wh why yeah, Job did this, or he didn't do this. Let me explain to you why I wasn't responsible for this. And he goes into some lengthy dialogue. Just brings them to creation. See, we finite human beings have no means of knowing the innumerable variables that explain why things happen precisely the way they happen. What I find interesting in this book, too, is that God sometimes uses a sense of humor to get his point across. Job 39, verse 13. He says this, The ostrich flaps her wings grandly, but they are no match for the feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on top of the earth, letting them be warmed in the dust. She doesn't worry that a foot might crush them or a wild animal might destroy them. But whenever she jumps up to run, she passes the swiftest horse with its riders. What is God trying to get across? I think here's what God's trying to get across. Is he, he helps Job understand the complexities and intricacies, the innumerable variables that it takes to create this inhabitable planet that we live on. He's trying to help Job consider something like, sometimes we just experience life as random and chaotic, like suffering. Why God? Or did I do something? We experience, this is how we experience our lives at times. It just seems, it doesn't make sense. And so what does God point to to help him understand this? He points to him to an ostrich. Because you've done this. You've been out in the woods. You've been out at a cabin. And you're saying, but God, why did you make the mosquito? Right? It doesn't seem like it serves any purpose. And he's saying, he's saying to Job, look at the ostrich. It has feathers, but it can't fly. That's weird. Seems random. And then, it, and then it's so dense that it, takes, it lays its eggs in, in the ground, or on top of the ground, where animals just come around, you know. But here's what God is trying to cut across to you and to me. I created a bird with feathers that can't fly because look what it does. When it gets up, it's the fastest, is it the fastest land animal? No? Okay. Second fastest? Okay. It's one of the fastest <laughs> land animals, and it can even burn past a horse with its rider. So what is God saying? Yes, we experience life sometimes. Why, God? Why this? Why this? But he says, if you will look at how I created things, like an ostrich with, with feathers that can't fly, that's too dense to lay its eggs in a place it won't things will step on, but I have a valuable purpose for the ostrich. 
It's got a valuable place in the order of the things I made. And you will never in your limited human frailty and finiteness and understanding ever understand this. But I have a purpose and a place for even, yes, the ostrich. And he's saying to Job, he's saying to you, he's saying to me, in the experiences that you're enduring or going through, I have a place for you too. You have a valuable place in the order that sometimes seems random and, and you can never satisfactorily have an answer for. So the point of these questions isn't for God to tell Job and his friends they're stupid, they're idiots. That's, that's what poetry, that's what the, that's what the writer is utilizing, the, the language he's utilizing to point out something more significant. He's using these questions in this language, in this confrontive language for a purpose. And it is to, be, to expose how little Job and his friends know about God's creative power and his wisdom and what he has created. That's the point. God's response in his questions is highlighting Job and his friends' finiteness, their limitedness, their ignorance of the intricacies and variables of what God does to create life that we know it, even with its fallout. See, in the end, the question of why me or why Job is really unanswerable. I think that's what that's the book is telling us. It's unanswerable because it's a mystery only known to God. But the point of the book of Job is that there is no mystery about God's character and his nature. God is good. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. And he's all-wise in what he's created and what he's doing, even from our small perspective and the, the answer isn't in Job's character. It's not in God's character. It's not going to be found in his character. It's not going to be found in Job's, uh, Job's flaws or his sin. Those are the wrong questions. And the right question is, stand before God's infinite, wondrous, amazing, majestic creation and let him speak to you and be filled with the awe that is replete in all that we see and touch and feel. See, we do experience life as arbitrary and chaotic, but it's because we're limited. We're just never going to know. And I am a person that doesn't like that answer. The, the, the problem of evil, the problem of uh, why, why is God, who is all good, all powerful, all knowing, why does he allow suffering in the world? That has been a problem that, I've, that has actually as I'm able to look back on it, has helped me grow in my relationship with God because it's a question I wanted to answer so badly. I've read books and books and books and books and books. That was kind of one of my, one of my things all through seminary. I wanted, to, I wanted to figure this thing out. And I think Job is like, you're never going to figure it out. No, no, ask the questions. This is an anti-intellectual sermon, by the way. It's like, ask the questions, wonder, explore, but you're never, ever going to fully understand the complexities of God's nature and character of this world. Now, to make sure the story is complete in Job, I've left out an important thing. Some of you know, right? Because what happened in Job chapter 1? What happened in Job chapter 1 was a confrontation that Satan has with God. And Satan basically challenges God, oh yeah, of course Job follows you. Of course Job is is loyal to you, faithful to you, because he's got, his, he's got the perfect family, the perfect job, and the, what, the, no health complications. Easy, right? So, so Job, God kind of makes this bargain, but Job and his friends are never aware of this. Throughout the whole story, they're not aware that this happened. This is the reason. And I think the point is, and, and, and as I've thought about this and read books and all that, I think the point isn't like, okay, does, why would God make a bargain with Satan? I think here's the point. This just continues the same theme that I'm trying to help illustrate in God's confrontation with Job, is that you just can't know everything. And that God creates this wonderfully complex system called earth, 
that's hospitable among the thousands of planets in the world in which life is fully possible. We'll never understand all those complexities. We'll never understand that perfectly. And then you know what you also won't understand? Is that God is contending with spiritual forces and principalities that you'd have no idea. And God, you'll never understand God's decisions and the complex reasons why things happen in our lives. It just is unanswerable. It's a mystery. However, he says, trust me. Trust my wisdom. You can't control, you have no control over the planets or the sun or the stars or the animals, but I do. Rest and be assured by all that you see that I am who I am. What time is it? I'm trying to decide if I want to make this other point. <laughs> we have a tough time with ambiguity, let's be honest, don't we? We want to know the answers. That's what separates us from the animals. And I think sometimes we just want the simple answers. Why? Uh, so I'm, you know, bad things are happening, God must be doing it, bad things must be happening, I must have done something. And God says, uh-uh. Neither one of those is either a satisfactory answer or really explains who I am. And I think this goes back all the way to the Garden of Eden. Because in the Garden of Eden, what you find in the Garden of Eden is the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, right? And Adam and Eve succumb to eating the tree from the knowledge of good and evil because Satan tells him a lie, doesn't he? What's the lie? You can be like God. What is essential in understanding you can be like God? Is that you must reject this idea that you're limited and finite. That you must live within these boundaries of a limited understanding of the world, even of good and of evil. And Adam and Eve's pursuit to take of the good and evil is a, is a, a fall, you could say somewhat upward, in the sense that they want to elevate themselves beyond their limited creatureliness. Isn't that kind of part of the fall? And I think the same is true for you and I. When we come across these hard things, it's like the last thing I want to do is accept the idea of my, my borders of my own limited wisdom and understanding, my, the borders of my own knowledge, and trust the wisdom of God. And I think essentially you see this story being played out in Job, whether it's behind the backdrop of the curtain where they don't even understand of the, the confrontation with evil powers and principalities, or whether it's in Job's finite suffering. And God's call for you and I in that. It's not, it's not perfectly helpful to you, you logicians, <laughs> but I think it's a satisfactory one. Trust that God's wisdom is. Trust in his wisdom. So here's my hope today. My hope today is this, that you will begin to live your life less as a distracted driver through God's creation. <laughs> that you will get outside of yourself, your problems, your, your work, your relationships, um, and you would, you would step out in God's creation and do it intentionally, you know, not just like go up to the cabin and, let, or I, you know, sometimes they're like, oh, I want to go camping. And you get out camping, and you're like, why did I go camping? I hate camping. But go out with intentionality. Bring along your Bible. Bring along this passage of Scripture. And stop asking questions. Sit down and be quiet. And allow God's creative majesty to begin to ask you some questions about your life and your circumstances and your place, that you are significantly insignificant. And may that spur you to know and discover God. So here's two things I think I learned from Job, particularly in this series of awe, and that is that God confront, that confronting God in the complexity of his creation, here's the first thing I think we learn, is it disrupts the questions we ask about our lives and of God himself. Isn't that what happened to Job and his friends? They're asking all the wrong questions. I think that happens to us. That's why I think God says, step out. Get off your phone. Get off your, you know, get, get, get out of the mess of your life a little bit. And the, the complexity of your relationships. 
because your questions are all wrong. And begin to wonder and marvel at the majesty of God and what he's created. Did you know that most physicists, physicists agree that our universe is so finely tuned that if we were to modify the constants of nature just slightly, life would never appear as it does in our universe. So imagine this humongous scale, like you got, you're going to create life to be able to exist as it does. This huge scale. And you have to, there's only one little line on that scale that you have to make an adjustment to get that tuning so gravity works just precisely so life will exist. That's, that's what God does, by the way. So anyway, let me, let me go on. So if you set gravity to be too strong, you're just off a little bit. Too strong, the stars would be unstable and would be deadly to our planet. You set it just a little bit too weak, and the stars would struggle to create oxygen and carb, uh, carbon, and we would not have life as we know it now. For our planet to have gravity set to the exact right setting so life can exist for us, mathematicians or physicists came up with this formula. Here's the chances of the, what, we are, what we experience gravity is now. One chance in a billion. Times a trillion. Times a trillion. Doesn't that make you stop? Steve showed that video last week. I'll, we'll show it again. But the, the infiniteness of the universe and this tiny planet in which God has made a, habit, a habitable home for you and for me so that we could experience him is an amazing wonder. And it reminds me that I am a significantly insignificant But we struggle with God's wisdom, don't we? <laughs> maybe, maybe you're not like me. But we struggle with the wisdom of God. I do this all the time. We go to a scripture, I'm reading a Bible passage, and say, really, God? You want me to do this? This really doesn't make any sense. But we struggle with God's wisdom. I think parenting has given me a new, if I can say this humbly, a new empathy for God. And I think part of the purpose of this book is to actually ironically give us empathy for God and how he's created the world, how he's placed you in it, to get you off your why God or why me questions. But I have an increasing empathy for God as I became a parent. Probably know where I'm going with this. Because kids sometimes fail to trust the wisdom of their parents, don't they? I'll never forget my son was four years old and the van had been parked, I think over the weekend, Van had been parked out in the sun, and that, that day that it was ended up being parked, um, we, I got the kids all that chocolate milk in those little plastic bottles. And my son only finished half of his drink and left it in the van. Well, we went out on a Monday, I think we were going to school, and as soon as Joe opened that door, I could see the look in his eye. I've got chocolate milk in the van. I forgot! And Joe starts running towards the van, and it was like slow motion. Don't drink the chocolate milk! <laughs> Joe didn't care. He heard me. Threw open the door, opened that bottle of milk, put it down the gusset, or the, put it down his mouth. About t 15 seconds later, he barfs all over my van. <laughs> and it's in that moment, I had no empathy for the wisdom of God. Isn't that at least remind us today? Man, you know, kids, by the way, kids, if you're here, your parents have this lived experience that you have not, you have no context to understand yet because you haven't lived it. You don't know it. It's not even in your radar yet, but you think you know it. And your parents are given by God to you because they have a greater, broader, wider context for life than you do, right? And so when they say don't drink the chocolate milk, believe them. And isn't that the whole point of Job? God doesn't answer their why me, why God questions. He just says, Job, trust me. My knowledge, my understanding, my, my, the way I've created and ordered this universe makes sense. But maybe not to you right now. But one day, it will. 
I think when we get outside, get outside of our problems and our struggles and our pain and just let God ask us questions and be informed again about his goodness and his character and what he's created, I think it disrupts your questions. I think it gives you new answers as we are humble enough to admit our ignorance and our arrogance, <laughs> honestly. Here's the second thing I, I learned confronting God and the complexity of his creation. It leads us to experience God for himself, for ourselves. Sky Juthani, the writer, author, spent a part of a summer in New Zealand as a teenager. And he writes that one night I went on a walk with a group of friends along the shore. The sky was amazing, literally unlike any night I had seen. From one horizon to the other, it looked like a brush loaded with glitter had painted the Milky Way across the sky. We stood there for what seemed like hours watching shooting stars in awe-filled silence. Around us were small clusters of people scattered along a shoreline in hills, all gazing in wonder at the heavens. We were all strangers from different parts of the world, speaking different languages, but that night we all felt the same. We were united by our insignificance. And he goes on to write, Humans are wired to respond this way to creation. What other animal appreciates the beauty of its environment or contemplates its self-significance while looking at the stars? You know, the birds aren't contemplating, hmm, I wonder what the meaning of life is as a result of the experiences that I'm having right now. Do they? They don't even conceptualize time animals, but we do. We know there's an end coming. <laughs> a sense of awe and wonder is a uniquely human and it uh, is a uniquely human emotion and it is the beginning of all worship. The instinct to worship emerges from a deep sense of our own inadequacies, here's the irony, and cosmic insignificance. God has designed us this way to provoke these feelings in order to point us to himself. That God, you're wise, and I'm not. You are unlimited in your understanding, and I am finite. That's what... That's what awe does to us. That's what getting outside and wondering again about who God is and what we see. That God is proclaiming, he's talking, he's speaking. He's pouring forth night after night, day after day. Because we are creatures, <laughs> we're not machines. And that we can view life as a program, and that we're all in some parallel universe. People are actually talking about this now. Like we're all in some simulation. We can view life as a program or we can view life as a miracle from God. We belong to a creator that displays his wisdom in what he has made and sustains right now with the work of his hands, which ultimately is fully known as the apostle says in 1 Corinthians, that in Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. Because ultimately here, in the end, it will not be the seas, or the mountains, or the canyons, or the clouds, or the great galaxies that fill your hearts. Because only God can do that. Through Christ, his son. So here's what I want you to consider. Perhaps the best solution for you and the things that are, you're distracting driving in life is to put down and to get outside. To take a walk at St. John's, the woods. To go to the North Shore and sit at Gooseberry Falls. And not just like for an Instagram moment, you know, hashtag love and life, but to walk with intentionality. God, I think I have all the answers. Compared to you, nothing. Would I be humble enough, God, to even repent of my own arrogance? Would I repent of my own sense and striving for significance apart from the glory and the wonder of all you've created and 
not only that, who you revealed yourself to be in the pages of Scripture, in the person of Jesus Christ. And would I trust your wisdom, even when I don't want to, when I want to drink the chocolate milk. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you continue to work in this series to stir all of us new answers? Would you cause us to to wonder again? To get outside of our information technology that's always screaming at us and to sit down and shut up and stare at the marvelous wonders of your beauty and to remember, God, that you have created created us. We're limited in our understanding. But God, we, we recognize that we're significant to you in and through the person of Jesus. May you give us clarity and understanding of our place and our purpose. In Christ's name, amen.